Ambassador Garamil Makata Saptan Karelo Hershin is a Guinea Corps and an Gator Chess of Yetinoha Saram Velif Tronona, Agus Winter and Kurt Stoit, the New Helen. Garamil Maga Saptan Firkin Forge at Arashiv Romain, a Rev Mavan Kelisavian is in Tara, at our chest along my honour on Realtus. Minister, Minister, may I first of all thank the Ambassador for that introduction, and may I say what a great pleasure it is to be with you all this afternoon. I'm accompanied on this state visit by Sabina, and obviously, but very particularly on behalf of the government, by Charles Flanagan, uh, the Minister for, for Justice and Equality, and a distinguished former Minister for Foreign Affairs. I had a great opportunity of meeting some people already from Ireland who have been here uh, for, uh, in more recent times in the practical tasks of reconstruction. But some of you have been here for a very long time. Uh, I've been thinking about the connection between Ireland uh, and New Zealand and, and it is a very uh, interesting, it is a very, very interesting one. It is one where it has interwoven our two histories at different periods of time. May I just say, however, this most recent engagement between Ireland uh, and New Zealand is one of immense human importance. More than half of the people currently who are Irish born, who are living in this region, have come in response to the recent earthquake. And it gives me great, great privilege, it's a great privilege to be able to pay tribute to their work along with others in the tasks of, of reconstruction. Uh, this afternoon I had an opportunity of visiting the Earthquake Memorial Hall and saw the names of the 185 victims carved into its marble stone. And of course, each name is a life cut short that was full of promise and contribution to New Zealand, but above all, a loss to loved ones uh, and to their families. And among those names, uh, and the Earthquake Memorial War were the names of two Irishmen, Owen McKenna from Mimi Vale in County Monaghan, and John O'Connor from Abadone in County Kerry, and I was privileged to meet their families, both young men making lives for themselves in New here in New Zealand with an enormous contribution to make. And it has been a privilege to meet members of Owen's and John's family, and I am delighted that they have been able to be with us again this evening. I've mentioned this parallel that exists between Ireland and New Zealand in the past. Uh, in 1895, Michael David came to Australia and New Zealand. He travelled for seven months, and he was very interested in the New Zealand form of decision-making. Uh, but he had another reason, I think, as well. We associate Michael David, above all else, with the Great Land War of 1879 and 1882, it ended, of course, with his cooperation with Charles Stuart Parnell and the later Land Acts that would begin in the 1880s and go on into the early 20th century. But David recognised something as well. In almost exactly the same year as 1879 to 1882, uh, there had been a land agitation as well here, uh, which involved the first arrivals in, in New Zealand and very particularly he was familiar with the name of Te Fiti, for example, and he spoke about his peaceful agitation in relation to land rights and the dispute as to the status between customary law and the new law. And it's very interesting in exactly the same way in our own lifetimes. These are issues we share. We share issues about the interpretation of treaties, the issue about how, in fact, whether treaties are satisfactory or not. We are always doing things almost in parallel with issues that are within the consciousness of New Zealand as well. And then I realised very well as well, I came here 19 years ago just as the government was changing, and here I am again, and the government in fact has actually made another very, very significant number of changes. But I'm happy to say that New Zealand governments and Irish governments have a very positive relationship with each other. At the United Nations, 
And for example, it's very easy for me as President of Ireland to pay tribute to New Zealand's role in the rotation membership of the Security Council of the United Nations. And indeed, New Zealand is being helpful to us as we seek this for a, a period in relation to the future. We continually find ourselves on the same issues in relation to, for example, the very significant contribution of Ireland to the United Nations is in relation to anti-nuclear proliferation. Most recently, we cooperated with New Zealand again in the most recent treaty. And I was a young person, relatively speaking to my present uh, position, uh, when many of us read about the Rainbow Warrior and the extraordinary significance of the country Remember, our populations are roughly the same, both about 4.8 million people today, but then there were still, there were about the same, so relatively small population size. And it was very important that a country would say that it had the right in its region to be a country that valued peace, didn't want a connection with war, and was against nuclear proliferation. And then again, I think uh, what it required at that time was tenacity, courage, and the exercise of sovereignty in a way that couldn't be intimidated by even the most powerful. I think that uh, all of this in the present time, we find ourselves as people as well, uh, both agricultural countries. As I had different meetings at the time here in, in New Zealand, one of the things are very clear, and indeed the very valuable meetings I had on two occasions already with your new Prime Minister, uh, there are many places where Ireland will be cooperating with New Zealand in the new circumstances we find ourselves in Europe. We hope to give assistance as a bridge to New Zealand into Europe. We will be continuing to facilitate those relationships and equally we see New Zealand as a vital platform and partner for us as we speak to, seek to expand our trade uh, in, in Asia. I have said I was very but all of us were very moved uh, to visit the, the museum as it is, the special purpose museum to deal with the most recent earthquake. And I have to say again, it gives us an example. And I congratulate you on it, on your ability to be able to take and respect different color, co col cultures, different contributing factors to your present identity. I was welcomed by a very moving ceremony of welcome by somebody who was a brilliant exp who gave a brilliant exposition on the mythic sources and how the, and the Maori people interpret the earthquakes and what is happening in relation to their, to their culture. They showed a respect, if you like, uh, for ancient wisdom, the importance of symmetry, the whole nature of spirituality. And all of this enables us to say that here in Christchurch, you will, uh, not, without a doubt, show, you're showing something extraordinary, a spirit of resilience, being strong in reconstructing again and again, making something new. It was very moving to see great heritage buildings like, for example, the cathedral and the others, reduced to the devastation, reminding us again of the power of nature. But it is equally more important as well to see the power of the human spirit that takes decisions in making something new. I've often thought about this, about the continual renewal uh, of buildings and of life. In some ways, I think I remember writing once, everything in the end is on the way to being a ruin, but it is also becoming something new. And I think that in that sense, it's something that is, is very, very important. I mentioned Michael David's connection, but also, of course, we saw the statues we went along uh, to John Robert Godley. Uh, historians looking at history as well. Godley was born in Ireland and reared in England, but some people say that he got the job that Captain Thomas should have got. But Captain Thomas was very important, reminded me of something else that is so. Captain Thomas is the person whose drawings and whose surveys are responsible for the fact that Christchurch uh, uh, was a planned city. It has always been a great testament to planning. In its renewal and reconstruction, it is going to be a great contribution to planning. But also, of course, it was John Godley, Robert Godley, who got the job as the first leader of the Christchurch settlement. And of course, it is called after the college that he attended in Oxford. But he was interesting himself 
He was interested in the very beginning in, for example, introducing a, a systematic system of giving land and of so forth. And I think as Philip and Mike Scott tells us that he's responsible for the fact uh, that uh, Christchurch was always a planned city. She had a great passage which I liked in her description of, of New Zealand. She said, the forgotten 49ers who built roads, houses and accommodation, barracks for the newcomers, comprised 40 Northern Maori recruited as road builders, 30 former Australian convicts, including carpenters from Hobart, refugees from Wellington and those who had assisted them. And joining all of those was a very interesting other group of Irish people, those who had got assisted passages after the Great Irish Famine on Gortamore of 1847 to 1849. So all of these people came together. Godley was very different to other people who were establishing colonies in which he made an attempt to have things planned. Now, I, all of you, uh, are here, therefore, uh, when one puts it like that, one sees that in every, from the moment it was founded, uh, after the European, from the moment of the first arrivals, the tradition of the Maori culture is terribly important. And then after the European arrivals, from the very beginning, there is a connection with Ireland. And then in the issues that have to be resolved in relation to land, there is a connection with Ireland. And that is why David, coming along, thought something as my la most, a very important point. He said it is a very far, long place, distance away from Ireland. But this distance needn't be a disadvantage. They don't need to, re they needn't re repeat all of the mistakes that I have struggled with. And one of the most important essays in New Zealand history of that period is a very famous essay that said how we should avoid the perils and the mistakes of Irish landlordism, where 8,000 people had presided over a country that had lost a million in hunger through the famine and had to export two million in exile. And therefore there were early attempts, if you like. And then he looked at the new legislature that was coming into being, and he said they have a freshness which is missing in the countries, in some of the countries in Europe. So distance can be a great advantage in avoiding the mistakes of the orthodoxies that are failing elsewhere in the world. And New Zealand is so often ahead of the, of the posse in relation to that. Ahead on environmentalism, ahead on making changes, giving women the vote for the first time, ahead in relation to responsibility, in relation to peace, and to disarmament and denuclearization. And very often, of course, ahead well, probably most of the time in sport as well. And in that I pay tribute to you, and I do tell you the part of my mission here is to secure your, enthousi your enthusiastic sport, which is already on offer for Ireland's bid for World Rugby in 2023, when we hope to be welcoming people from the world. And I do think as well, in relation to women's rugby, you know, the Ferns, I think, in fact, actually, I congratulate them on what they have achieved. But here as well, in relation to our own games, the Gaelic Athletic Association, with its nearly 500, about 460 branches abroad now, uh, in, in, around the world. And I'm glad that it is here, that Christchurch GA is providing a very important meeting point uh, for those who are here, both in the recent period and for long before that. And then the Christchurch Irish Society, who will probably know much better than I these long Irish connections. I want to say one word only to those people who, for this sum of people, when people go abroad, as I did myself at times, and as many members of my family did, there are moments of strangeness and difficulty that have to be transcended. And pe some people are able to do this better than others. And some people have family support and others people do not. But to all of you who have stretched out a hand, a son, to all those who were suffering at any time, those who were having a bad time, all of those who have been assistants, I want to thank you for it. And I want to thank the people of New Zealand for the way in which they have welcomed Irish people in all of these circumstances. And I want to thank as well 
all of those who have gone on to make such a distinguished contribution uh, uh, to New Zealand in the contemporary period. Walking around looking at the reconstruction that was going on today and meeting the very fine m men and women from Ireland who are just with a smile on their face happening in this task of reconstruction and meeting others from New Zealand who welcome their assistance and are working cooperatively with them. These are very important values. These are very important exchanges. And they are just as important as the very positive exchanges in the United Nations building in New York, where regularly, in all the big issues I mentioned, peace, global poverty, anti-nuclear, trying to work on disarmament and all of those, the countries that are first into the bridge with new proposals, small countries, representing not just themselves, but the future of humanity, are those representing New Zealand and Ireland. Long may it continue. Is Gwim Gok Rock as Bana, their Gok a Togianta Aki, is Gok a Maker Shulaki, the Ice Duntaki. I so wish you health and happiness wherever you may be, and long may this cooperation between our two countries live. Goramila Mahaki, thank you. Thank you, Take a seat in the